everybody, and welcome to the Oregon Chapter Virtual Conference. This session's sponsor is our gold sponsor, Gettings Health. Gettings Health is a healthcare extended business office service and business process outsourcing company serving the healthcare provider industry. They provide services and technologies to hospitals and physician groups. Specialty areas of expertise include practice management, billing collection of charges, and support services, which are part of the revenue cycle management. Thank you for your sponsorship. Couple housekeeping items. Again, uh, we have the survey link in the chat box. Please don't forget to take the survey. We would love to have your feedback. This session is an overview of the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule 2021 proposed rule. Big changes are coming. Our speaker is Randy Bennett. A little bit about Randy is he is from a BKD National Healthcare Group and has a leadership role in the firm's Physician Center of Excellence. He's responsible for leading a variety of healthcare projects, including transactional and compliance consulting, the development of hospital and physician alignment strategies, and assisting healthcare entities with reform issues related to phys physician relationships. His background technical expertise relates to analyzing the fair market value of compensation of goods and services in the healthcare regulatory environment. He also has experience in analyzing on executive compensation for a variety, a variety of industries. Industries. Randy routinely performs technical research and writing with respect to emerging issues related to the healthcare transaction, including regulatory issues. He's a frequent speaker and writer on physician-related healthcare transactional and strategic topics. In addition, he's led numerous hospital physician alignment consultant consulting engagements related to compensation plan design, physician integration processes and strategies, on-call programs, physician-led management, and arrangements of others. Please welcome Randy. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. I uh, appreciate that. I should have sent the short version uh, <laughs> of all that stuff. My apologies. Um, so uh, what I'm looking forward to do uh, to doing today is, is presenting, um, so put, put my screen up here, is um, presenting on this topic. Um, it's a, again, it's a, it's a big deal. I think it's uh, gonna be very um, impactful. I just posted out on LinkedIn that there is um, about three weeks left in the comment period uh, for the Medicare uh, final rule. So um, if this is um, of interest to you, of concern to you, there's still a little bit of time uh, to get back into it. So um, uh, with that, I'd say uh, I'm, I'm uh, looking forward uh, again to uh, spend some time with you today. So let's get right into the material. Um, we'll talk uh, probably for about mm, 10, uh, 15 minutes on um, just sort of what's in the rule uh, to some degree. And then uh, we'll transition over to um, uh, kind of what does it mean? And then finally, we'll, we'll finish up with what do we do about it? Uh, so we'll get right into the good stuff. So um, there are a few things that we aren't getting into. There are MIPS updates um, that we're taking a total pass on, uh, probably a little too detailed uh, for this kind of overview. Um, there's a transition of the practice expense RVU. Uh, again, we uh, aren't um, uh, going to be able to get uh, too, uh, too, too deep into that, but four areas we, uh, you know, I want to touch on at a high level is one, telehealth expansion, um, and, and that is, um, I saw some headlines about, oh, um, telehealth's permanent. Um, well, it's not, uh, but it also won't fall off a cliff. So um, here's the thing, during the public health emergency, which we're still in, um, Medicare, CMS issued um, waivers to allow for um, a, a, a temporary expansion uh, of services and, and temporary increase in who can uh, utilize the service and bill for it. Uh, but really we'll take an act of Congress to, to truly make permanent. What they have done, uh, like I said, is to make sure it doesn't fall off a cliff. And what, what um, we can expect then is that uh, the telehealth as expanded and there's some more um, modest expansion uh, within the rule schedule 
um, will continue through the end of the public health emergency or the end of uh, 2021, whichever is later. So if somehow we're doing this in 2023, it will end uh, in 2023 um, or 2022. So um, that's, w- that's what's going on on, on telehealth, um, some technical things there. But uh, what it gets to is that providers are going to be more productive and more uh, predictable in terms of being able to utilize that as a strategy uh, to get with patients. Uh, the next one, again, this is, um, uh, got telegraphed last year, as all these did, really, um, and is a part of the public health emergency temporary rules, but there's uh, coding and documentation updates, and those are generally seen as streamlining activities. Um, and so I'm not a bill or coder, but I understand that um, the medical decision-making or time-based approach is allowing uh, providers to sort of take a better-of approach as to um, how to bill. Um, and so that, you know, my, my sense is that that will give providers a slight increase in productivity as you're able to sort of uh, optimize, um, you know, re- you know, reimbursement and, and, and the charges against um, sort of the, the, best, the best fit. Um, and then the last two are really linked together um, and is probably where all the headlines are coming from. And, and the first one I'm calling RVU inflation. Uh, and, and we'll talk, uh, you can see the, the chart on the right. For the main new and established office patient visits, um, and those, those numbers don't look too different, um, you know, left side, right side there, but um, the uh, the increases for the new patient codes, which is the top set, you know, is you know probably eight uh, percent average again on an effective basis increase for, for work value for new patients. That's really on the uh, uh, experienced or established patient visits. Uh, that the experience, again, as we've analyzed this for actual provider distributions, feels like a 25% increase. Um, but, but you can see, but some of those percentages go as high on a, a line-by-line basis as uh, mid-40s. So it's a, it's a huge increase, basically. Medicare is saying, look, um, on a policy basis, we believe that these primary care services are, are worth more, that the work is more intense, more stressful, more valuable. And so we are, we're, we're using our our magic wand and, and you, again, uh, it's based on the code utilize, utilization, not um, specialties, but generally speaking, it's primary care providers, people spending five days a week in a clinic that are heavy utilizers of these codes. Um, so think primary care and, and Medicare, I think from a policy standpoint is saying, this is how we get primary care where it needs to be. This is this is how we support primary care doctors, behavioral health, promote access. So from a policy standpoint, uh, makes sense. Um, I'm not sure that is a political issue in terms of one party, another party, whatever. Um, I think, though, that it is a policy statement. And so I think MedPAC for a long time has said, uh, has voiced concerns about um, the, uh, the uh, disparity in compensation and, and reimbursement between primary care and specialty cares. Um, you know, and the recommendations for these increases came from the ROC. So I think Medicare... Um, really is, is, you know, trying to put its money where its mouth is to some degree and say, hey, uh, people who use these codes, uh, we value you. And these codes are worth more uh, than they used to be. And so um, that's the key to this whole thing. Now, if you look at those codes here that are on the screen, um, if you are higher level, um, e- E&M uh, codes I make up a, a huge percentage of uh, Medicare spend, uh, I want to say 40%, and these 10 codes on screen are like 20% of Medicare spend. So I'm, I'm off a little bit there um, mathematically, but it's pretty close. And so if all these codes are getting what feels like from a utilization standpoint, a 25% increase, um, you know, that there's, there's got to be another shoe to that. So what, what is the offset to that? So if Congress doesn't appropriate more money, you know, Medicare Part B uh, is a closed system, right? Um, I think the variance is like $20 million or 25 or $30 million in terms of, you know, if, if Medicare is proposing changes to the fee schedule, the net impact has to be um, relatively small on a percentage uh, difference basis. And so um, CMS had a choice, and, and we know that we know the answer. But one of the choices was to go back in and say, "Hmm, pain management, the codes you guys, uh, you all are using, um, 
or surgeons, your codes, we're going to deem your surgeries worth less in terms of work our views. Um, I, I didn't know what they would do and they wouldn't say when we asked, uh, but it turns out that they punted on that. They decided not to specifically pick and choose codes uh, for winners and losers. Uh, what they did instead is they, um, as every good accountant knows how to do, they plugged. Uh, and the plug in this kind of thing is the conversion factor. So you have all this RVU inflation, we're pump, pumping in all kinds of RVUs, again, 20% um, of all the claims uh, dollars run through these codes. So huge utilization, big increase in work RVUs. The other shoe that drops to make it budget neutral is the conversion factor dropping. So conversion factors dropping um, dramatically, uh, 10%. Um, in you know, my 19 years of practice and I'm looking back as far as I could find records, I haven't seen a change this big. Um, you know, they had those proposed doc fixes every year or the statutory doc fixes through the sustainable growth rate that seemed to always get fixed every year where it sort of became a joke. Well, MIPS came in, fixed and replaced that a few years ago, the macro legislation uh, and the MIPS program and those sorts of things came into being uh, to replace the sustainable growth rate. Um, and, and really the conversion factor has been flat for 20 years. Um, and that's, that's really what's driven so much of the provider uh, consolidation across the country. Um, and that, and has necessitated um, where there isn't direct employment, um, you know, sort of these expansive foundation models or professional services models uh, to really uh, support provider compensation. And so um, in my mind, the industry has moved really um, far away again, you, you all know this, but more than half of providers are now employed, um, just a half million providers employed uh, roughly. Uh, so, so big number, big counts. And, and truthfully, because of that, I think the impact on this is, is really a little bit misplaced. So this is my personal opinion, obviously. Um, this would have been useful, a useful kind of change from a policy standpoint 15 years ago. Um, or even 10 years ago, but the consolidation um, that's happened in terms of provider from employment or quasi-employment, uh, the ship has sailed. Uh, and so what, what, what's happening now is really, um, and, you know, there's a technical element here and, and, and then there's this kind of secondary market of provider comp, which, which we'll get into in detail shortly, that's really going to cause a lot of havoc. So four big things that are happening, telehealth expansion and coding and documentation, this RVU inflation, all of those three things, all those first three things are, are going to generally serve to increase uh, work RVU counts at a provider level. And that will um, that'll become important here in a minute. Or I should say its importance will become more apparent in a minute. So um, next slide here is, uh, you know, what's the impact? And I guess I've, I've probably given most of this all, uh, away already, um, uh, but uh, would say again that, that the impact is, is uh, all over. Um, every specialty is going to feel this uh, one way or another. Um, so again, focus on the conversion factor just, just for a minute um, in, and, and, and really kind of illustrate the dollar change there, uh, just, just uh, under 11%. And then one of the things uh, is also happening is that anesthesia is following suit. So anesthesia bills and units, uh, these ASA units, um, uh, I cut and pasted the table from the proposed rule to show that the impact is uh, just, uh, just under 10%. Um, or just just at 10% really. Um, and, and so want to point out um, on this slide um, that there is, uh, you know, an impact, not just in employed arrangements, which we'll focus on, but also um, on services arrangements. So if you're subsidizing anesthesia, um, uh, for instance, uh, in, in, in your surgical department, uh, that subsidy arrangement, th those anesthesiologists are receiving about 10% less in collections from uh, traditional Medicare. Other payers may follow suit um, or they may not, depending on what the uh, contract says, and what the rights are to change those numbers. But uh, this is going to hurt. And a lot of this conversation is about um, kind of the employed medical group or, or, or professional services arrangements. But there are definitely some, some more indirect impacts as well, like through uh, subsidy arrangements. Okay, so as we kind of get into this next section, 
this is a, a, a pretty simple illustration of where the impact comes. And so um, the impact uh, really come, it, it kind of blue line is, is total impact. So you think about um, how the fee schedule works. It's, it's all the uh, RVU components, sum to a total RVU adjusted by a conversion uh, a geographic pricing uh, adjustment, and then uh, multiplied out by the conversion factor. So the blue line really takes in all the elements. So total large chows, uh, total allowed charges gets to um, all the elements of reimbursement where the red line is really just focused on the work RVU component. Um, and so these are, um, this is Medicare's anticipation uh, by specialty from a kind of a typical utilization standpoint um, of what those changes will be. So we'll put a, a spotlight on, on, on this at a high level and then we'll, we'll pick it up in a detailed example. Uh, here on slide 14 shortly. Um, okay, so uh, this is, you know, start to unpack, well, what does this mean? Um, there's a reimbursement impact, and that will be really based on, again, for an employed medical group or for a specific arrangement. Really the impact of that from a reimbursement standpoint will be based on the utilization of CPT code. So there's no, there's no new money in the system. Um, and so it is right pocket, left pocket within the fee schedule from an expenditure standpoint. And so if you're employed medical group, uh, you're employed medical staff or, or through significant arrangements, if their utilization um, you know, is a perfect mirror of uh, Medicare expenditures, terms of how much in each category, then there would be a zero impact because uh, it's a zero sum game. Um, I haven't seen that yet. I've seen generally um, modestly negative impacts from a reimbursement standpoint. So there's more work RVUs in, in primary care for those code sets, um, which means more reimbursement um, because those, those lifts of 25% really outweigh the 10% conversion factor reduction. So you see a lift in primary care on reimbursement. Um, and then you're seeing declines in specialty care because they're not really getting much of a lift uh, from those changes. And, 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 and to the extent that they do, they're getting swamped by the reduction of conversion factor. So it really depends on your mix uh, in terms of what the reimbursement impact is. And again, I've got a nice slide coming up, uh, slide 14, that'll, that'll show some of that. The more important slide, and so 20 minutes in, we've finally gotten to the important part of this, because um, reimbursement impact you know, will, will, will change, will be somewhat blunted to the extent that there's um, diversity uh, of, of providers. Uh, the big side is really on compensation, the big impact. And um, so many arrangements are set in reference to the fee schedule. And the fee schedule really has been very stable since 2012. Um, and, and really 2012 had a, um, had some significant changes, but even those changes aren't, aren't this big. Um, and so what, you know, what does that mean? You know, if it takes, let's say $300,000 to recruit an experienced internal medicine provider, it's probably a little too high, but say it's 300,000, um, you know, physician contracts are, are interesting. They're the most, um, sophisticated and nuanced contracts, um, that a, that a health system has, right? M most people are employed at will and there is no contract at all. And, and the employment relationship is simple. It's a salary, uh, maybe it's a salary and bonus um, for uh, management, uh, maybe it's you know, uh, wages and wages plus overtime, right? And all those compensation structures are, are really simple compared to physician arrangements who might have eight different pay types um, and eight different pay rates. And, and, and what the contracts do is they really take that $300,000 it takes to get a doctor there. And, and they really pretty neatly um, calibrate pay to work effort, whether it's clinical work or teaching or administrative or medical direction or leadership or call coverage or APP supervision or quality or whatever. All these different types of ways to measure and pay for work effort means it's complex. Um, but again, this, there's no science to this, but I, I've, believe that um, at, at, at least a good majority of provider contracts, um, especially for clinic providers, 
you know, doctors who spend most of their time in a clinic and uh, proceduralists, uh, right? Uh, vast majority of those arrangements are um, set in reference to the interview schedule. And there's a lot of merit to that. Um, and a lot of people said it's a good idea and, and it's a fair way to reward work effort. But at the end of the day, from a budget standpoint, you put $300,000 in the budget, you recruit at that number, you pay out at that number. And if there's a little more work in one uh, work type and a little less than another, you, you might pay a varying amount. But the recruitment amount, the budgeting amount, you know, the market, it's really in real dollars, whole dollars, $300,000. Um, that you might pay a base of $240,000 and a work RVU bonus of $50 per work RVU in excess of $4,500 work RVUs and 10,000 quality and all these other factors, that those are just ways of calibrating and, and getting um, alignment around certain issues and, and calibrating pretty exactly uh, work to pay. And so what's happening now is that the whole system, um, I mean, it's not the whole system, but a big chunk of the system, the EM codes uh, significantly, not just the 10 codes we identified, but probably another 30 or 40 more are changing significantly. And so the score keeping system, if our views are kind of a scoreboard, you know, how, how much is my work worth? Um, it's a great scoreboard. I, I, I love RBRBS. I think it makes a ton of sense. But this change is really a shock to the system. And in that shock, what you're going to see are winners and losers. And, and the impact at a reimbursement level is um, meaningful and it's important and it might be material. Um, but the impact at a compensation level is uh, three to four to five fold, uh, depending on the specialty. And so kind of this, this idea that, you know, if Medicare changes at fee schedule, that all of a sudden I'm going to start paying a lot more money out to providers under these contracts, you know, if you do nothing is, is true. Um, you know, if you, if you, if it's, standard policy or practice or specifically referred to in a contract that you pay based on the current year Medicare physician fee schedule, um, then if these, uh, if the proposed rule goes through as, uh, goes through as final, as of 1-1, you will start to pay more for the same work. Uh, that's, um, I mean, truly going to be unsustainable for some of my clients, especially smaller clients. Um, where there just isn't room to give in margins. Uh, but when we have done these analyses, we've seen very typically that uh, the exposure, the financial exposure is um, significant. So <clears throat> I think that for the next slide, you know, so what this is, you know, the MGMA average has been ticking up a little bit every year in terms of what the average loss is across all specialties. So again, assume a diverse mix of, um, provider types, you know, so what happens in the future? I mean, pretty obviously losses go up and, and the type of analysis that we've done so far is indicating that those losses will increase uh, somewhere between 20 and $40,000 on average per provider. So some more, some less. Um, but, you know, if you have a hundred providers, um, you know, think 20 to $40,000 more in subsidy. Uh, on average. So, you know, what's showing there is, is kind of the trend line um, in a, in a do nothing scenario. Uh, again, we keep doing business as is, and we just accept that the fee schedule is a business risk. And now we have to pay providers more uh, because of the contracts um, assuming no mitigation, you know, those numbers will jump 30, 40, or, I'm sorry, 20, 30, $40,000 uh, a year. I'm nothing but good news today. So I, I apologize. So um, talk about managing impact. Next slide is the one I keep, uh, well, uh, one of the next slides, two slides from now is the one I keep teasing. But um, basically, you know, every good presentation has a call to action. I know it's, it's a little early for the call to action, but um, really the answer in here is um, determining uh, the financial exposure. And so uh, the next slide, again, will we'll illustrate a lot of that. I'll spend probably 10 minutes on that but need to figure out how many contracts do you have that reference the fee schedule? If a contract doesn't reference the fee schedule, then, then you're really limited to a reimbursement impact. And while that's important to figure out from a budgeting standpoint, um, again, you've got three weeks to comment to Medicare, but 
um, the reimbursement impact is going to be um, whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's really out of our control, uh, out of your control, out of my control. Um, and so that's just going to more than likely need to be accepted. And, and again, to the extent that you've got a diverse set of providers, it's not going to be earth shattering. Um, but knowing, oh, we've got a, we've got 500 arrangements that reference our views uh, in terms of the payment for services. Oh, that would tell me we've got a lot of work to do to figure out what the uh, exposure is in those. So again, the bullet, I will try not to read the bullet points, but understanding the reimbursement change is important. And it will be important um, to, to look at your uh, payer contracts. Um, I've been up and down on this in terms of what my expectations were, what I've found and what I think now. And so I, I've, I've sort of come full circle. circle. Uh, at first I thought that because so many times I hear about payer contracts as a expressed as a percentage of Medicare, I, and I'm not a, payer contract person. I'm a, you know, a physician, uh, enterprise, a deal person, really I work with doctors, uh, fair market value, those kind of things, a reimbursement. Um, but the payer contracting side is not my background. And so I assume that um, most of the arrangements out there were set um, specifically in reference to the Medicare physician fee schedule. And then, and then I worked on a handful of projects earlier this year and, and I, we're kind of digging into the payer contracts, not, not even for this purpose, but for some other black box kind of stuff. And none of the contracts I looked at referenced um, uh, Medicare really directly. So it's an analytic, it's a way to think about how we're getting paid relative to Medicare. Um, but then as I've done some, some work specific to this issue in the last 60 days, um, have been seeing actually there are, there are a number of provider contracts that do really directly reference uh, the fees, the Medicare, Medicare's fee, fee schedule. So one bit of homework, again, is to figure out for you, for your health system, for your provider arrangements for which you do billing, um, is, it, is this limited to traditional Medicare in terms of reimbursement exposure or do you exposure across your payer contracts? Um, of course, even if it's indirect, I, I think payers are smart. And if it's good for them, they'll send you a notice that says we're adopting what Medicare has done. If it's bad for them, you won't hear from them. Uh, so pay attention to that, I guess is one, but, but two really need to start getting into what do our contracts say, uh, in terms of rate. And if there's a change in RVUs, um, what's our financial exposure. So, um, top line is, is, is reimbursement. Um, you know, and then, then, then beneath the line, below the line, really focusing on the change in provider compensation. Uh, you put the two of those together and you're, you can really start to get a provider by provider uh, f uh, picture of financial exposure. And, um, you know, if, if you, you know, if you sum it, you know how big the financial exposure is. And if you sort it, you can see, you know, where your exposure is, you know, for some providers would be more on the reimbursement side, for others would be more on the uh, compensation side, for some of those be both, it'll be ugly. Um, but but that, that type of analysis, if you have not done so, if you're not already down this uh, road, um, is, is, I would say is an urgent priority because, um, once, uh, once the fee schedule, uh, goes into place, uh, January one, um, and you, and, you know, and you realize, Ooh, this is a big issue. We've got to fix it. Um, and you go back to the providers, it's going to feel like you're, you're, you're taking money from them. If you get in front of it now, on the other hand, uh, and you say, look, Medicare has changed the scoreboard, you know, the score, uh, the scorekeeping system on us. We're trying to solve for that $300,000 of, you know, work you did this year for pay you got this year based on a, a slightly adjusted or, or significantly adjusted scorekeeping system. Then um, you put, you know, you can, it's a different conversation. And, and so the power shifts, the closer we get to the rule change. And as we get into next year, uh, power shifts. And so um, we'll talk about timing uh, here just in a second and, and, and kind of what the timeline looks like. But um, really, if, if, if your organization doesn't know the financial exposure here, it's worth, uh, uh, worth it being a priority. And I know there's a ton going on. So um, again, I should have put this slide at the front since I referenced it about 20 times already. But, but here it is. This is what we've done for um, uh, this is, you know, 150 provider, employed provider medical group um, where, we, where we got all the information. 
and, and started to organize and sort. And we, you know, for these kind of presentations, I've pulled seven provider types. So I'll just give you a second to look at it. So um, again, uh, at the top, just walk you through it for a second. Uh, seven seven provider uh, special uh, specialties across the top, um, and this is the same work. So there's no assumptions, you know, in terms of 2020 RVUs, 2021 RVUs. It's really the same work, um, just just adjudicated under the new fee schedule. So um, what you see then is a difference and a percent difference in that there's a, there's a range of outcomes there. And then because um, this particular client uh, didn't have the type of contracts that uh, referenced uh, Medicare directly, we, we only calculated a Medicare uh, collections impact. So again, for the pediatrician, you see none, which makes sense. Um, and then uh, next there's this, uh, the compensation impact and that, I mean, that could have been its own whole spreadsheet, but I've, I've really condensed it and calculated a difference uh, for the primary care providers at $45 per work RVU, um, the oncologist at 85, the general surgeon at 55. So we'll talk about it all in a second. So I think this um, does a nice job of illustrating, you know, the kind of analysis I think you should be doing and, and, and summing um, and, and trying to you know, direct your attention. So again, for the pediatrician, same number of visits as prior year, all of a sudden does 24% more RVUs. Pediatrician is getting a $46,000 raise. Um, you know, they, and then really this doesn't even, you know, that, that 45 assumes that's fully loaded um, and, and there you know, still be some, some, you know, payroll tax, if nothing else, to, to, to goose that a little bit. Um, and so you think, you know, is, this, is that the right result? Um, is a $46,000 exposure and additional expenditure, does that make sense uh, for the same amount of work? And I, you know, I'd, I'd argue no, um, that, that that does not make sense and, and frankly might not be sustainable. So uh, that's first provider. Um, and then just to comp contrast and, and I, I won't walk through each one alone, uh, but to take the next two, you see the internal medicine provider um, by a scope of practice has uh, a lower, um, uh, increase. Uh, and so the internal medicine, I think, as we looked at some of the uh, doing more procedures, more in-office procedures, um, like dermatology type procedures and, and less straight um, office visits like the family medicine provider. So as we looked at that, accounting for different levels of busyness um, uh, overall and, and mix, we, we're getting a reimbursement impact. So, you know, again, you see the family practice um, being credited with 1,300 more RVUs. And, and that um, generating a whopping $9,900 more in reimbursement. Internal medicine, same thing, 15% lift, seven or $6,100 in reimbursement. You look at the compensation impact because the RVUs are, RVUs are calculated without, without respect to payer, right? So who cares what kind of patient it is? It's one of the beauties of using an RVU system, um, but every RVU is getting paid out. Um, whereas, uh, you know, the collections impact is, is limited to a single payer in this analysis. Um, and so, again, you can see kind of a, a range of outcomes there that are pretty significant. Um, and some of these are at the higher end, um, and, and some are, are, are not. Um, the hospitalist, so kind of mentioned, uh, think primary care, think Lyft and RVUs. It's not really everybody. It really is code specific. So the hospitalist was a good example of not much impact. Pretty much a normal year to year, 1%, 2%, 3% um, positive or my, uh, negative variance um, for the same uh, code set. And so we're showing no change in compensation as this, this particular provider was paid on a shift basis. Uh, but you're seeing the financial exposure really express itself in uh, change in collections, uh, right? So this, this, this is a specific calculation. So it represents the mix of patients that are Medicare for this provider. And the change in conversion factor really expresses itself pretty truly, if you will, at, at that 10.4% rate, really close to the uh, percent change re in, in reduction of conversion factor. Um, so again, you start to see like what are the different wrinkles. Uh, next one, uh, medical oncology. And, and, and again, you should just assume this is at the top of your list unless you have providers you know are paid um, a straight salary. 
uh, or, or similar, some type of pool model, uh, panel model, something else. Uh, but for most traditional models that reference work RVUs, um, going to see a massive increase in compensation in part because it's, you know, for all the, you know, top 40 typical special specialties, it really has the highest conversion factor of compensation per worked RVU. And so what that does when you get this 13% lift as this provider has, you know, $150,000 increase in compensation, you know, the offset Medicare reimbursement uh, uptick, just, uh, you know, pathetic at $21,000. So your net upside down $130,000 roughly. Um, you know, if you've got eight of these uh, kind of providers, it's, you know, you're looking at a million dollar kind of impact for same work. And that's, um, right, that's a challenge. That's a commercial challenge. Can we afford to do that? That's a compliance challenge. May we pay that much? Is that still fair market value? Um, you know, and that's, it, it, maybe it shouldn't be this way, but taking a pediatrician from $220,000 to $260,000, you know, that's a big jump. Um, you know, just, just like what we're seeing on here, feels a little different to take a, an oncologist from 750 to 875. I mean, it just, uh, it just really um, eye catching, even though the percentages are similar, it, it just, uh, there's some audit risk, I think, uh, as those numbers creep up. So, um, uh, I have not seen any of my clients on any of these projects not have medical oncology as sort of top of the list in terms of we, we got to get in front of this. The, the last two, again, I'll take together, and I know we're, we're hitting our last five minutes, um, and so we'll not go here as this is my last slide. Um, but you can see general surgery, cardiac surgery, again, kind of the typical up and down um, that you would see normally in a year-to-year -year fee schedule change with uh, updates to misvalued codes and uh, additions and deletions of codes and so forth. And so not much difference um, in RVU, R R RVU amounts uh, assigned. Um, and, and so you will see a lot of this uh, for proceduralists. And, and um, that is because, again, they didn't pick and choose winners, um, but where the pain shows up is going to be in uh, reimbursement. So that 10% reduction is going to show up. And again, it depends on the mix of services and how many office visits are, that are there that are, again, for the general surgeon, that might be unbundled, that might be creating some offset relative to the 10% conversion factor reduction. Um, all those types of things just come into play. Um, but, but you see, again, financial exposure driven primarily uh, by changes in reimbursement. And so a lot of volume, um, you know, and... Um, uh, you know, you know, higher mix, uh, things like that. So, um, that, that's the, 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 this is the kind of impact. I think this is pretty representative, um, you know, for your advanced practice providers, uh, your PAs, your MPs, you know, you're going to see a similar impact. Um, more of those tend to be paid, not on a, um, uh, RVU basis. So you see the impact more on the collection side. Um, and, and as we look at the, uh, those APRNs or, or, or whatever, again, sometimes we're seeing some lift um, because those, again, uh, maybe stereotypically, but tend to be more primary care, um, tend to be lower paid, tend to be paid where there's not financial exposure on the compensation side. Um, so some of, that's, um, some of that's very good and helpful. Um, but this is going to certainly put strain on performance and, and make it more important to think about what is the right mix of uh, physicians and APPs and, and so forth. So um, one question came through, I'll just answer, does CMS have a table uh, to compare? Yes. So um, if you email me, I think my contact information is on the next slide. I would, um, I will send you a link to Medicare's fee schedule. And then I do have a year by year comparison for impacted codes. Um, and so there's about 40 codes or so um, that are impacted. But specialties that got lift include um, emergency medicine, nephrology, the OB bundles, um, some behavioral health codes. Really, um, uh, Medicare went through and determined what historically, what, what service codes historically had been set in light of uh, the, you know, the typical office patient visit. Um, yeah, patient office visit, um, 
and and so um, so some of the nephrology uh, service bundles got increased um, to sort of um, stay in lockstep with the RVU changes. Again, same thing with the OB bundles. Same thing with emergency visits. So there will be a variety of specialties that got lift. If again, historically, uh, the primary uh, codes that they use uh, were set in reference to the uh, the, the fee schedules, um, new and established office visit codes. So um, in terms of like, again, we've got three minutes left and, and it, that sort of feels like the, uh, the amount of time left to, to solve this, to understand and solve this problem. So uh, one, determine your financial exposure, but two, understand what the timing is. This rule goes into effect uh, January 1, uh, 2020. Medicare normally gives a 60 day window, um, but they've been late, late on releasing everything all year. They're, they are three to six weeks uh, late and every, um, every release uh, basically that they have for propose, proposed rules and whatnot. And what they said in the draft rule is um, we're not gonna issue the final rule timely either. So instead of a normal 60 day window, that's gonna be 30. Um, and, and so uh, they've, they've, they've signaled that. That means um, that they will issue it as late as December 2nd. Um, and so again, I think this is a political thing that they'll want to take a victory lap on. I'm not sure that it's administration specific. I, I think there's sort of a general goal among policy types to, you know, from MedPAC on down, um, to reward and incentivize primary care. I'm not sure this is how I do it, um, but I appreciate where they're coming from. And I, again, um, as I talked to our DC insider, um, he's hearing no buzz in Congress about fixing this or doing something about it, which means it's in CMS's hand to act or not act. Um, they telegraphed that they would do this in the, in the 2020 final rule, which came out last November 15, um, in published form. And so they, you know, in, in, in their mind, they've been, you know, there's been a year's worth of notice on this. And, and so again, they won't tell us what they're doing, even though we, we keep trying to ask, but I would expect, I think it's more likely than not, this rule passes as final. They might transition it in, but but really you're looking at a 30 day window of certainty around is the rule going to pass as proposed yes or no to fixing it. So you got to find out if you have um, an administrative authority to continue to pay under the 2020 fee schedule um, or must you adopt the 2021. And if you can on a unilateral basis, continue to pay under the old fee schedule that will buy you time. So if you can do the, accomplish that from a governance standpoint and not accept too much legal risk, because the doctor might sue you and say, wait, you're paying me wrong you owe me all this money under the new fee schedule. Um, you know, they've been some exposures. So you need to talk to uh, counsel after you understand uh, what the financial impact is and, and where you need to set your sight about, can we change this unilaterally? Or do we need to go and negotiate new contracts? If you've got a lot of providers, there just is not a lot. Even if you have five providers, it's not a lot of time to get a deal papered. So really um, there's a lot of pressure, uh, I think, to, to, to get done on this. And speaking of getting done, it's 545, and I'm gonna declare victory as being done timely. Um, would love to connect on LinkedIn. Uh, if you have questions, let me know. If you wanna see the fee schedule, please send me an email uh, and I'll, I'll get you directed. Tammy, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Randy. I, there is a question on here. Does CMS have a table uh, compares to 2021? And the, they, did they you answer do. that already? Yeah, they, they, they do. Email me. I will send a link um, timely. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, great having you at the Oregon chapter, full of information. Thank you. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure. And for uh, our members, uh, please don't forget to fill out the survey links. It is in the chat box and we will see you at our next session. Don't forget the save the date. October 14th is our webinar and October 22nd is the next virtual conference. Thanks everyone and have a great day.